Well, I can see that uh, we've got all sorts of wonderful, stimulating conversations going on, which is what these conferences are all about. Um, so, if everybody can gather and sit down, uh, it's a chance for me to introduce uh, our final speaker of today, Professor Timothy Barrett, who is looking at the world of Buddhism as it spread beyond India to China. The title of Professor Barrett's talk reflects recent work in which he's been trying to understand how religious traditions, meaning principally Buddhism in China, bring not only messages of salvation, but also in a way broader horizons. And I'm about to uh, quote shamelessly from an email that he sent me because I thought it was such a vivid picture. To a Lancashire mill worker or Mississippi cotton picker in the 19th century, mention of places like Jerusalem and Babylon may not have been real, nowhere beyond their daily grind was, but they surely raised an awareness of a wider world. And Professor Barrett is going to argue that Buddhism had the same effect in China. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, this is about uh, uh, India beyond borders, and, and so um, I uh, make no excuses for um, uh, taking things well beyond borders into the world invisible, though of course I'm also talking about the orientations of human beings towards that world. Um, and of course that is an entirely imponderable area. Um, not that there aren't problems even with uh, the more visible world when it comes to cultural influence. You, I think we've learned in this country that a man may um, have as much curry as he likes without changing his Anglo-Saxon attitudes, um, for example. But uh, when you get to things like um, um, how long do suburban housewives have to practice yoga before that actually has any effect on their ways of thinking, again, that that is... Um, even more imponderable. Um, so uh, we're heading into dangerous territory, and I'm very glad that uh, Gillian just gave that example um, of um, the kind of rather nebulous um, area I'm dealing with. Um, well, uh, I'm mainly talking about uh, China um, uh, and um, Many of you will have had some experience of, of uh, dealing with East Asian civilization, uh, and many may recall that uh, not too long ago, textbooks about Chinese history tended to have titles like Walled Kingdom. Um, some of you may have seen that book. Whereas nowadays, if you look at the textbooks that are generally used for uh, pre-modern Chinese history, they're more likely to have titles like open empire. I think there was an Italian gentleman who said that uh, all history is contemporary history. Uh, and indeed, um, one can see that uh, in the area I'm talking about, you don't have to look very far to see that uh, uh, China has been open to outside influences that we can see before our very eyes. And I'm not just talking here about Christianity, which has certainly uh, seen some success in China. I'm talking even about um, what, what is often taken as the bedrock of Chinese religious observance, you know, going to shrines and so forth. Um, recently, I had some correspondence with the Anglo-Chinese poet Sarah Howe. I don't know if you know her work. She has a book called Loop of Jade, in which... Um, on reflection, when she talks about it, she says she was a bit baffled by what she, in her poetry she calls tree-tied pleas. In other words, prayers tied to trees that uh, she had seen in Chinese shrines but didn't remember from her childhood in Hong Kong. And I uh, uh, wrote to her and, and um, pointed out that, in fact, um, it's been shown that uh, this only really came into China um, in the past 15 years um, from Taiwan, probably. Um, but ultimately um, from Japan, where they do have written messages at shrines. Uh, and she wrote back to me and said, in some ways this confirms in my mind that it was the right aesthetic decision to leave the detail in the poem. For those who know, it reveals the tricksy divergence between reality, memory, and imagination, which I wanted to explore in my book. And... Obviously, when dealing with the world of the unseen, the imagination reigns supreme. Um, 
and in this case, what has happened is that a, a cultural, uh, at least a political barrier, given current um, uh, attitudes on the mainland of Japan towards Japan, um, on mainland of China towards Japan, has been jumped completely. Uh, imagine, imagination seems to um, just not respect those boundaries. Um, in fact, influences from that direction um, are in historical terms uh, fairly recent. Uh, Japan has played a role um, in China in the past uh, century or so, but not so much before that in terms of cultural change. Um, but um, if we look at uh, this, this great central kingdom, this Zhongguo, um, you know, um, by adopting that name for itself, it's uh, obviously talking about uh, privileging its position and so forth, but by talking about being at the center, it also brings into um, play the fact that it's also on the periphery of other centers um, and has been throughout history. Um, if you look at the term Zhongguoren, for example, for a Chinese person um, in the 14th century, or no, probably 15th, um, in West China, Zhongguoren meant a person from China, not a Tibetan, for example. But that's not the current usage. Obviously, um, uh, how you understand the center and the periphery varies over time. Uh, we heard just now about the languages of Yunnan, and uh, it must be said that um, uh, the fact that the, until you get to Vietnam, which has its own historiographic tradition, there is really no historiographic or literary tradition that challenges the position of Ch Chinese in the South. Doesn't mean that throughout history, these areas right up to the Yangtze were not um, at least originally predominantly occupied by uh, people who did not speak Chinese or even languages related to Chinese at all. Um, we don't see, apparently, uh, little in the way of a uh, cultural influence on the world unseen from that direction either. But look, for example, at the story of the Monkey King. You know, the great Monkey King leaps over cultural barriers even into um, uh, you know, Western, the Western imagination these days. As an op back, enough, uh, back far enough, you will find that originally uh, he was a monkey god um, amongst the non-Chinese peoples of the South. Um, that's in, in Glenn Dudbridge's book about the origins of the legend. So even from the South, there are um, influences to do with the world of the imagination, the world of religion or whatever. And of course, when it comes to Northern peoples, um, they did quite often intrude into the Chinese world. In fact, the Mongols and the Manchus actually took over China. Um, Recently, I was at a conference at uh, the great, uh, what is now a Buddhist center, Wu Tai Shan, um, in, which is really, in some respects, quite far up towards that sort of cultural border between uh, Chinese and non-Chinese to the north. And I gave a paper suggesting that what may have originally attracted the interests of the rulers of China at a time when those rulers were not Chinese in, in the uh, fifth century would have been um, the caves on the mountain, which meant something within their religious tradition. Um, and not necessarily the same thing in the Chinese tradition. And when I sat down, having delivered this uh, suggestion, um, my neighbor in the next seat leaned over and said, in fact, Mongols still come to Wu Tai Shan because of the caves today. So there are cultural influences coming in uh, relating to beliefs in the unseen um, from all directions. And the West has to be, the West that links with India has to be the uh, prime one. Um, now, uh, uh, for something like 2,000 years, we don't know exactly how it got from India to China. It's at a period when the records um, are somewhat thin. Um, there is, of course, the story that the emperor 
dreamed of the Buddha and therefore sent envoys to the West to find out more about who this person was. But uh, I think it's pretty well accepted that this is a, a retrospective narrative. And um, I think if we look at what happened, uh, it's perhaps good just to give a glance to a much later period and the introduction of uh, Christianity to China. There is a very famous stele um, found in the 17th century that gives a narrative um, composed in the 8th century about how Christianity came into China um, about a century or and in any case. After all, though, it's clearly the product of, of South Asian civilization, civilization as such, but